Uh, good morning all. Thank you for joining and welcome to our Forest Wise webinar. We have Richard from Forest Wise presenting today and he is the head of sales and marketing and we are really pleased to work with them because they have the wild harvested materials. I will now pass it over to Richard. Thank you. Yeah, hi there. Good morning, everybody. OK, so uh, we'll crack straight on. So uh, right now, uh, when I got up this morning, the temperature in the UK was about one or two degrees C. Uh, in Borneo at the moment, it's um, 31 degrees centigrade, just to give you an idea and to try and warm you up this morning. So um, this presentation uh, is going to uh, uh, take sort of three, uh, maybe four sections. First of all, we're going to talk about Borneo, um, the, uh, the, the island itself, its biodiversity and the threats that it's under. I'm going to talk about uh, sustainable development, which is kind of where we are now in terms of our sort of product range. And then we're going to talk a little about regenerative um, agroforestry, which is where we're going in the future. And we're going to explain why that is so important. And then there's a couple of slides at the end where we'll just uh, sort of basically list and give a few details about our uh, wild harvested products. So I'm going to start off with this um, this quick film. So some of you may have seen this before. This is available on our website and, and also a link on our emails as well. But we'll just run this. It takes about a minute. <laughs> Good start. It's worked last night, I promise. There we go. Richard, we can't hear the sound of the um, video clip. You can't? No. OK. Don't, don't worry. So I understand you couldn't hear the, the sound there. Uh, I have no idea why that is. Um, OK, we'll just uh, carry on. Um, basically, that was a summary of uh, what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation. So um, uh, hopefully this, this can be edited out of the, uh, the streamed available version later. OK, so uh, Forest Wise uh, was founded uh, just uh, four years ago uh, by two guys, uh, Dutch guys, who have lived in uh, Indonesia for a total of uh, 20 years. So this isn't some sort of gap year experiment. This is uh, the two guys who are sort of fully committed to the island. And uh, although we're headquartered in uh, the Netherlands, uh, we have actually now since 2020 uh, set up a factory uh, which operates in uh, Sintang, which is uh, in West Kalimantan. Kalimantan is the Indonesian name for, uh, for Borneo. Yeah, that's better. OK, so. More and more of Borneo is looking like the picture on the left hand side. Borneo is under a lot of threat from various uh, sources. Uh, including plantations, principally sort of palm monoculture, uh, logging, and also gold and uh, coal mining as well. What Borneo should look like, and at the beginning of the last century did look like, was uh, the picture on the right hand side. So every one of those trees is a sort of mini uh, biome, uh, biodiversity hotspot all of its own. Each of those trees will have um, thousands of different species of insects, uh, birds, plants, fungi, everything like that. And the devastation in the last few years, and it's continuing now, despite what perhaps the palm lobby will try and tell you. Um, if anything, in recent years, it's actually accelerated a bit. So Borneo is the world's third largest island. Uh, if you look at a map, it may not look like that, but it actually is. And although it only represents 1% of the Earth's uh, land surface, 
it represents 6% of the Earth's biodiversity. And so we see it as a true biodiversity hotspot. So the World Wildlife Fund uh, has focused a lot on Borneo as a, an island uh, where the biodiversity really needs saving. And they've, they've recognised it as a globally significant biodiversity hotspot. And I found this, uh, this quote by Charles Darwin, uh, who described Borneo as one great luxuriant hothouse made by nature for herself. And that's a great way of uh, describing it, I think. So we need to stop deforestation. We need to, we, what we do, the aim of uh, ForestWise is to make sure that uh, the local people protect their own rainforest and don't uh, cut down the trees, which is obviously a point of uh, no return. And we do this by trying to ensure that they can extract more value out of the rainforest than they would do if they were to become a sort of smallholder for a, 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 a palm uh, company. And we call this rainforest value. So that's the uh, sort of key hashtag for, for our company. Uh, but that in turn depends on a sustainable development model, which uh, has sort of three pillars. You have the environmental, economic and social. They are all interrelated. And it's just one of those things like the market going, uh, it just is taken away, the whole thing collapses. So it's quite a delicate uh, operation. But altogether, when it's um, ticking away nicely, it is true sustainable development. So, we talk about deforestation free quite uh, quite freely, and uh, what that means for us is that uh, we actually uh, employ local people, local communities who actually live near the forest to wild gather the, the raw materials for all of our products. So there's no farms as such, no small holdings. It really is just wild gathering of raw materials which naturally fall onto the forest floor or which can be harvested in, um, you know, from the trees. So we don't harm the rainforest in any way. It really is a very, very light touch. So we have a mutual commitment. As long as we can buy the, the raw materials that they, they do some basic processing on, um, they will protect the rainforest. And that's the full traceability throughout the supply chain for the, for the products that we source. And we do, there's a formality about this as well. So there are legal agreements between us and sort of uh, the village elders or councils, it varies from one area to another. So these are called um, forest protection agreements. And we have six in total at the moment, and it covers a total of 36,000 uh, hectares. And this is all backed up by international certifications as well. So stating something is deforestation free, is part of a real sort of holistic approach where you want organic, you don't want any meat, um, uh, you don't want to use child labour to, to gather the raw materials, no pesticides, uh, the, the whole kit and caboodle is a lot of um, things which make up this, um, this holistic approach. But in terms of pieces of paper, uh, our products are, um, some of our products I should say, are fair for life. We have the EU and USDA organic, um, one of our products is uh, Cosmos approved, Halal, Kosher, and we recently joined the, uh, the Union for Ethical Biotrade as well. So this is, um, I've just got a couple of very short clips here that we've made recently. These are two of the, um, uh, the collectors that uh, work with ForestWise. Uh, the first guy, he gathers uh, Alipe nuts and the second guy gathers Kukui nuts for us. Hopefully you can hear this. We can't hear it, Richard. If you can just read the uh, subtitle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a new challenge. I've not come across this one before. Not, I can hear it perfectly well, but uh, but uh, you guys can't. I don't know why. If you just read the subtitles then, please. Okay, so it's just two of uh, a couple of the um, the guys that we've had, and we're doing a lot of um, 
uh, filming at the moment as well uh, to help with sort of social media and to put on our website. So we talk about the uh, full traceability. We have, in fact, 840 uh, collectors who are working with us at the moment uh, on the uh, Alipe and the Kukui nuts. So these guys all represent a, um, uh, you know, a family of their own. So the reach of the, you know, the, uh, the beneficiaries of this uh, whole program uh, are far and wide. So the picture on the, uh, the left hand side is of one of the, the famous Indonesian longhouses and the mats, uh, the rattan mats uh, outside their houses are uh, used for, for drying the, uh, the nuts. So th the collectors not only just collect nuts and sell them to us, they do a bit of the basic processing as well to add value. And this, this also means that they're more involved, more committed to, um, uh, to, to doing this uh, process for us. So there's a, there's a washing and then there's a sun drying uh, process. And uh, finally, when the uh, the nuts moisture level is down to a certain level, it's at that point that we uh, we buy them from our um, uh, from our collectors. So the traceability goes all the way to the point where we receive the nuts, so we always know exactly who has um, has collected what. Uh, but there are many many challenges. Um, it's uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. Just little things that we take for granted in um, in Europe at the moment. So just, um, just sourcing food grade metal drums, for instance, that's a recent challenge. That is so difficult in uh, in Borneo because Borneo is is um, obviously a very, very large island. It does have a population of 20 million, but there's, there's very little industry there at all. Much of the um, uh, industry is in fact agricultural in nature and even things like drums have to be sort of imported from other parts of the, uh, the country. So just a little few of the challenges uh, we've had. Um, so when somebody passes away in one of the villages that work with us, uh, there is a seven day mourning period, which is, is obviously very desperately sad for the family um, and concerned and, and the village and the friends of the deceased. But for us, that, that's a, a major issue. Um, there are a lot of logistics and also paperwork challenges as well. And um, the government often changes sort of rules and licenses and things like that. So you have to be on the ball. And that's another reason why it's great to actually have a factory and many local people working for us. And to European guys who are sort of committed to the country and live there and understand all the sort of practices. And uh, as you can see in that picture on the right hand side, the roads can be absolutely impassable uh, in the wet season. We've got some great film of uh, uh, four by fours getting stuck in um, in the mud. So um, I mentioned at the beginning about sustainability and obviously this is a, a mega trend which is you know everybody is talking about this now you know when you have um, airline um, companies with sustainability managers then you know it's become mainstream. So uh, but why is sustainability just the start? Okay so this next few slides are going to explain uh, a little bit about uh, sort of where we are and uh, where we hope to be. So in, in two pictures, basically sustainability is like a sticking plaster on the current situation, whereas uh, a more regenerative approach is uh, working towards growing the, uh, the actual existing rainforest. So in a little bit more detail. So sustainability is really just things not being worse. So Right at the minute, we're in this sort of central zone here where uh, we are having sustainable developments. It's, it's scalable. Uh, we can make it bigger without, um, you know, um, making things worse in the forest because of our sort of light touch. So this is where the sort of wild gathering comes in. Uh, monoculture plantations drive it towards environmental destruction and um, degradation of biodiversity. And you have logging and mining, which is um, still worse. Towards the other end, what you can have is what we call regenerative agroforestry. So you've probably heard of regenerative uh, agriculture. Regen regenerative agroforestry is obviously what it says, um, developing and growing forests. And this leads to environmental regeneration and an increase in biodiversity. So what we're finding is that um, 
many of our customers, uh, the more sort of forward thinking ones, are um, asking us about what we can do in terms of regeneration. And this, this started on the smallest possible scale. So um, as a sort of Christmas present to some of our customers, we, um, we planted a tree for them and uh, we sent pictures, uh, we gave them the GPS coordinates and um, this led to a lot of really positive feedback, uh, often sort of quite personal and heartfelt. Um, and that was that was very, um, that was great for us as a company. Um, but then the sort of serious questions um, started, well, what more can we do? A lot of companies have um, a, a set of a budget for uh, these sort of projects. So, you know, could we look after those, um, you know, those projects for um, agricultural uh, or agroforestry regeneration? And um, we thought long and hard about it. And now we're in a position where we're going to be setting up a, a foundation uh, to collaborate with our, our partners, um, <clears throat> some of which are customers, some of which are just external organisations who, who are interested in, uh, in our work. And we're going to be um, regenerating forest. That's what we're doing. It's a win-win situation. Uh, we're restoring uh, forests. And that helps us to secure future supply of our lipe nuts and uh, kukumi nuts, as well as the other raw materials. So there's, you know, we benefit from this as well, which is as it should be. So the regenerative approach is, is broadly making things better. So if a uh, an area of forest has been um, deforested for a rice paddy field, for instance, we're in a position where we can reforest that. Um, some of the the rainforest has been, uh, you know, some of the primary trees, uh, the main um, trees have been cut down. And uh, so we are in a position where we can rewild degraded forest. And uh, what the World Wildlife Fund will tell you as well is when a, um, an area becomes fragmented, uh, you still have clumps of, uh, of rainforest there, but because they are uh, they're fragmented, you just lose the biodiversity and what you need is bridges between those fragmented areas. So if we can continue in this in this way and uh, regenerate the forests, we will improve biodiversity. And the way this works is um, in a similar way to if you just build a pond in your in your back garden, for instance, um, and just plant a few uh, pond plants in there, then insects will find that then sooner or later frogs will find that and you know the, the whole thing just develops so that is like on a mini scale it's the same in the forest you plant a few um, sort of trees and as they grow the biodiversity comes back into the area so you're providing a sort of framework for that bio biodiversity to reappear build it and they will come overall there's an increase in uh, productivity for the local people, increasing income and, uh, and profitability. It improves uh, food security and very, very importantly, it increases soil health and uptake of, of carbon. So one of the, the downsides, well, one of the most serious downsides of uh, deforestation is that you expose um, often peat, um, which has been laid uh, laying there just um, the, the forest in Borneo is I think about 300 million years old so it's had a long time to build up a lot of uh, locked in carbon in peat on the forest floor. What happens is when you take away the uh, the trees uh, you expose the peat it dries out it releases carbon dioxide it releases uh, methane and even worse, it's more prone to lightning strike and catching fire in that state as well, which is obviously a double whammy. The icons at the bottom are the, uh, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals that we measure ourselves um, with, our, uh, with our project, uh, the company as a whole, not just the, uh, the regeneration. So these are our um, plans at the moment. So the foundation is just being uh, set up um, before Forest Wise started as a company, there was a lot of work done on land owned by a, a monastic uh, order locally to, to Sintang, where we're based in Borneo. And they have um, granted us some land to set up a, a tree nursery. 
And the initial regeneration project is only going to be four hectares, which is obviously absolutely nothing in terms of the scale of the project that we need to do. But it's a um, it's really just setting up a, a proof of principle and sort of uh, building up trust with uh, with local uh, people that we're coming in, we're planting these trees and uh, trust both ways that um, they will sort of maintain them and uh, we will continue to support them. And uh, basically we're, we're looking for partners, uh, partnerships with customers uh, or other external uh, parties, NGOs, etc. And um, I'm not coming to you asking for, for money. Please don't take that, um, uh, that away from this. Um, but uh, we, we do need um, uh, funding and uh, this is a two way thing. We benefit, the forest benefits and also our customers will benefit from a sustainability um, uh, credentials will be improved still further. OK, so this is um, last couple of slides now. So this is what we're, we're doing. So you, you can see in the past um, the situation. So the, the primary rainforest was, uh, as you can see, in 1950 covered, I think it's 96%, uh, I think the figure was, of the, um, uh, the island. And uh, by 1985, you can see it's deteriorating. And in the 21st century, um, it's it's still going. It, you will read a lot of uh, greenwashing to say, oh, it's not as bad as it used to be. Things have slowed down. It, it is really bad out there. So that's the current situation, which is very stark. I'm sure you'll agree. So what we're hoping is that um, we can start making a difference and us and um, you know, the, the fallout from COP26 and all, all these other external influences on the Indonesian government will mean that we can start growing back the, uh, the rainforest back to approaching what it was. So uh, just a couple of um, slides about the products uh, that we can offer. So these are all wild gathered and so we, we've calculated, uh, we've got all the sums to sort of back this up, that uh, whereas a, a monoculture plantation will earn a smallholder between 1,400 and 1,500 per hectare per year, uh, we believe that this can be doubled um, if they just do wild gathering. So um, there's a range of uh, products here, um, some of which are development products like the, uh, the rubber seed oil, and, and rubber is something else we're looking at at the moment. Rubber is not indigenous to um, uh, to Borneo, but it, it's basically it's there now. So we um, we want to sort of sustainably develop that. Um, around the coastal areas, you have um, coconuts, uh, so we have coconut uh, oil, coconut sugar. Uh, we have this unique product uh, called Buamira oil, uh, which is this very very dark orange um, coloured vegetable oil which is full of beta carotene and alpha tocopherol. Uh, Alipe butter, we have different grades of that. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the crude, that's the uh, sort of pale yellow version uh, with a sort of characteristic odour, um, which is very sort of, it's not unpleasant, but it's um, distinctive. And then we have a refined version as well, which is uh, sort of white, um, colourless, odourless. Uh, Kukui nut oil, also known as candle nut oil and kamiri oil locally. And then we have a Renga rainforest sugar as well. And what we have in common is that all these raw materials are just wild gathered from the forest floor or up in the trees um, where people go and sustainably um, tap the, uh, the, the syrup for the, for the sugars, for instance. And um, it, it, it's a really, really sort of light touch. And then I think the last slide I've got is this one, so this is a little description about our, our products. So all of these products have local sort of indigenous uses, which have been in place for for decades, if not centuries. Uh, so Alipo butter traditionally used as a skin moisturizer and for sort of minor skin conditions and sunburn. And uh, it's got properties very similar to cocoa butter from the formulation point of view. Uh, we find its main application um, similar to cocoa butter, skin creams, uh, body butters, lip care, where we would recommend the refined version. And it's got structuring, thickening and emollients uh, properties. And we have a report to, um, to support that as well. Uh, the Kamiri or the Kukui nut oil. Um, 
this uh, this can be sourced anywhere from Hawaii all the way through to India, I think. Uh, but the it is traditionally used in uh, Indonesia, particularly for uh, protecting the skin and hair of babies. There's a, there's a sort of cultural tradition for that. And in sort of formulation work, you reduce that in skin creams and body lotions. And the key USP for this is a, an amazing drying oil. You know, it has a really, I'm rubbing the back of my hand now, just thinking about it. The, um, uh, the oil uh, penetrates very, very quickly and leaves a really sort of dry surface. And many people have commented on that. So if that's something you're looking for, that would be um, definitely an oil to consider. So um, virgin coconut oil, you'd be very familiar with that. Obviously, basic uses of uh, food, but also locally traditionally used for, for minor skin conditions. And so you'll be familiar how you use um, coconut oil and its properties. Um, Arenga principally used as a food, obviously. Uh, in personal care, we would suggest it's used in masks. Uh, it can form a sticky base for a depilatory cream. Uh, it can be used in lip care and scrubs, uh, etc. And it has that sort of tacky, um, exfoliant um, properties um, for the scrubs and in, this, in terms of face uh, it's a way of making formulations more palatable particularly if you're using it around the lips or around the uh, the mouth and uh, finally the uh, the buomira oil so um, extraordinary oil this I've been involved in vegetable oils for about 25 years and I've never come across this this one and um, it's getting a lot of interest um, because it's a unique appearance it can be used as a natural color for instance and um, it can be used at low levels in skin cream I would not apply it to your skin neat uh, or else you'll have a sort of an orange stain there until you wash your hands two or three times um, but it, at low levels, it's um, it, very strong antioxidant properties due to the vitamins I mentioned. And um, we're looking at this as a sort of nutritional supplement as well. So we're just working on that to give you an idea of um, where we're going with that. So um, I'm sorry there was uh, one or two issues with you listening to the, um, the clips. Not sure what happened there. Um, I, I, we'll try and rectify that for the stream version. I'm not sure how we'll do that, but there we go. Right, back to you, Rina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for the presentation. It's actually amazing to see that you're going beyond sustainability with the regeneration approach. Um, are there any questions for Richard? Um, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat box. Um, hey Richard, you're right. Yeah. Um, right. Do you have a, like an, a supply cap, an upper limit where you can actually uh, supply your customers? Because obviously, if we say release a product and it's immensely popular, um, yeah. and then you're not able to supply, then that pro product might be discontinued, and then you lose money and profit, yeah. which go into people. Obviously, we would do as well. Yeah, re reliability uh, is, is a key aspect of what we're doing. And if you'd asked me about a lipe butter 15 years ago, I would have said, uh, no, 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 no. You get a crop every two or three years, very unreliable, avoid. Uh, since joining Forest Wise, unsurprisingly, I've changed my opinion. So um, because we've actually got people on the ground, um, they are talking to people all the time. We have field offices uh, going around and they can uh, they always know when something's in flower in a particular area and of course three or four months later we'll get the seeds falling to the ground. So um, to answer your question about um, the sort of scalability of it, right now right now we are, um, I think it's about 2% of the existing primary rainforest. Thank you. That we're covering. So um, that is definitely scalable. 2%, we can take it up to 10% very, very easily. We've got people knocking on our door, hoping to be part of this project all the time. So um, I, I don't anticipate any supply issues with any of our uh, products. It's, um, it's on a very, very firm foundation, which is scalable. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, because the other thing obviously is weather conditions, all that, like you said, not just for harvesting, but also transport, um, everything like that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the uh, I, yeah, I, I showed you this picture of the roads there. Um, the, it can be tricky up to the uh, the factory. 
Um, but once you get to Sintang, which is a, uh, I, I live in Andover in Hampshire, and it's got a population of 80,000 people, exactly the same as uh, Sintang, it's, it's crazy. But um, the, the main road from Sintang to the uh, the main port at Pontianac, uh, it's, um, it's about an eight hour drive, but it is a tarmac road, so that that's okay. That's um, That's not an issue, but it's just getting stuff in and out from the the factory to the town which is the uh the worrying bit but um that's something we just work around yeah because if you've got a um, particularly rainy season obviously it can um destroy the roads and which is which is always fun uh, yes yes exactly i've seen that in in kenya in a previous life yeah so um, yeah yeah but one of the, one of the things i've um uh, that, that's happening due to climate change and uh, um, obviously there are some appalling things going on in the world at the moment um, but we we must never forget that you know the climate change issue is there and it's just not going away that's for sure uh, but one of the the things is that um, climate change in Borneo has meant that the the cropping of the Alipe butter is actually more regular so that's um, you know that's obviously a, a very thin silver lining to a very big black cloud but um, that, that that is one benefit that we're seeing is that the the ilipe is becoming more predictable in terms of cropping and harvests. And yeah, and going back to supply, what what would be the effect if um, you became immensely popular? Uh, would the wild harvesting cause any kind of impact as well? well on the the forests. Yeah, think? yeah. So um, like if you like I said you. What you said, the Lippy butter, you've got what two percent, you've still got loads you can actually harvest. Yes. Say yeah. that you got incredibly popular with some of the oils, and that would harvesting that actually cause um, more destruction. No, I don't think so. Um, because you know, the way it's gathered is, is literally people walking along uh, fairly well established paths through the forest and just picking up, like we would wander around the English countryside picking up conkers. Uh, or acorns, um, you know, in, in the autumn, it's exactly the same. They just, uh, you know, just wander a little bit from the path and just collect it. So there's no, there's no harm to the uh, the trees or the soil or the wildlife or or anything. It it really is, you know, zero effect. Thank you, Richard. Is there any other questions? If if anybody would like any samples or further information, um, please contact your account manager. Um, and I think um, we, we can close the webinar now. So thank you so much, Richard. Thank you all for attending.